Welcome everyone. Uh, we're glad you all could join us today for the third installment of our Lunch and Learn series. Uh, before I introduce our presenters today, I'll first cover some of the basic details on the layout of today's webinar. Uh, all participants will be muted for the duration of the presentation, but we certainly encourage and welcome all participation and comments. Uh, so we will have time for questions at the end of the, the presentation in kind of a Q&A format. We just ask that instead of uh, speaking your questions, we just ask you utilize the chat function and direct message me. My name is Will Schneider. Um, you can send questions throughout the presentation or at the conclusion, and then I will facilitate the uh, Q&A once the presentation wraps up. Uh, we'll do our best to get to as many of the, the questions as possible. We just ask that you keep your questions focused on the work that's presented. Uh, so with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, today's presenters are Drs. Alita Hahn and Tessa Peters. Lee serves as the Land Institute's lead scientist for our Kearns of Domestication program. He joined the Land Institute in 2001 after receiving his Master of Science and PhD in the areas of agronomy and applied plant science from the University of Minnesota and worked on a number of Land Institute crops before fully focusing his time and our efforts on domesticating Kearns in 2010. And Tessa Peters joined the Land Institute in 2019 as our first ever commercialization manager, leading the commercialization efforts for Kearns and our other research crops. She holds a PhD in plant breeding and plant genetics from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and worked for the Organic Seed Alliance prior to working for the Land Institute. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Lee and Tessa. Hello. Am I up, Will? Yep, you're good. All right. I'm going to share my screen here. And is that working? Oops. There. Is that working well? Yep. All set. Okay. All right. Um, thank you for that introduction, Will. Um, it's great to be able to, to chat with you all today. And I uh, just want to give you a very brief introduction to this, this new crop that we are developing that we call Kernza. Um, it's hard to know where to begin and end on, on the kind of long story of, of Kernza. It, um, it's it's the plant that you see here in the picture, um, growing on uh, about a 30 acre field in Minnesota um, in that particular picture. Uh, but this is a, a perennial grain candidate that we've been developing here since about 2003. Um, I started that work uh, when I first got here. And um, really we, we continued it on from a project that began with the Rodale Institute and then the USDA um, over about the decade before that. So uh, it's a project that now has, is kind of coming into some um, maturity and getting to the point where we have collaborators uh, all over the United States and all over the world. So um, I can't mention every one of them and, and all of the work they're doing, but uh, just know that uh, even though I'm going to concentrate on kind of my work, um, there's a big team here uh, with, with many members, uh, particularly at universities, and also partners in, in industry as well. So let's see if I can get my slides to go forward. Here we go. So um, often we can give a whole one hour presentation on, on this one slide here, but I just wanted to cover a few of these topics just to, to let you know why are we doing this. So it's, it's quite difficult to take a, a wild perennial grass like intermediate wheatgrass or what we market as Kernza and, and turn it into a plant that we can harvest for, for human food, harvest the seed, um, and eat that directly like we would eat other grains. Um, because these plants naturally don't make very much grain and, and they're not easy to harvest. So why would we go through to all of this uh, long effort requiring dec decades of work and millions of dollars? Um, really it's because of this long list um, of benefits. Uh, just a few of them is you know, perennial grass with a deep, uh, thick network of roots. Uh, does, it prevents erosion, but it even builds soil. So the, the rich soils that we grow our crops on, for the most part, were developed by perennial plants living there with large root systems that that biomass of those roots turns into soil over time as it, as it decomposes. Um, so that process builds soil health. And you know, right now, we're really interested in what we can do to mitigate climate change and increase in carbon in the atmosphere so that exciting opportunity to actually move carbon back out of the climate, uh, climate to change causing atmosphere, get it out of that, that space and back into the ground where it does good things for us um, is a great opportunity. Um, there's a lot of benefits to farmers. Uh, we're, we care a lot about uh, 
developing a system that will improve farmers' economic situation and therefore the health of rural communities and things. Um, I was raised on a farm in southern Minnesota. Uh, one of the, the main reasons I wanted to go into developing perennial grain crops is to be able to benefit farmers at the same time as doing good things um, for the environment and also feeding people all at the same time. So um, once these perennial plants are in place, they can do a great job of excluding weeds and uh, reducing the cost uh, to control weeds. They also, these big deep roots hold on to the fertilizer that's put there. That's the direct benefit of the farmer's pocketbook. Um, nitrogen fertilizer is lost at about a rate of 50% of what's applied goes into the, the water or into the atmosphere and not into the plants. That's a big cost to the farmer, but it also causes a lot of trouble. So as that nitrogen makes its way into the groundwater, uh, it makes it undrinkable uh, for, for humans, for instance. Um, wildlife habitat uh, directly by having perennial plants and provides nesting and um, habitat for, for birds and other animals, uh, but also just protecting uh, existing habitat such as streams, lakes, rivers, and oceans from pollution. Um, finally, uh, there's this benefit I'd mentioned, which is to be able to, to actually harvest biomass from the field. So, um, when we grow our annual grain crops, there's a lot of residue left over and there's interest in using that residue as, as a biofuel or feeding it to livestock. Uh, the issue with that is if you remove all of the above ground biomass after you harvested corn or wheat, um, that soil is going to be really open to erosion. And the great thing about perennials is that in, even in the natural ecosystem that are grazed, um, much of the uh, above ground biomass is removed every year from the prairie. And yet, because of that deep, thick, dense root system below ground, soil is being built instead of degraded. So uh, we have the opportunity to, to harvest more of the biomass produced if we have perennials and without uh, jeopardizing the, the sustainability of the system. Okay, I want to talk about kind of two pathways to creating perennial grain crops uh, to show where we are with Kernza. So on the left side of your screen over here, we have domestication where we take a wild species and uh, begin looking for plants that have the traits we're looking for, bigger seed, the ability to hold on to their seed, uh, fresh easily, produce more yield. And we cross those together um, and do that uh, over and over and over, generation after generation, and eventually we get uh, domestic crops. This is how we got uh, the crops we have today. It's how we have uh, the domestic livestock that we have today. Um, the, the kind of potential breakthrough approach is wild hybridization. So we'll take an annual crop like wheat and then tr try to cross it to a wild perennial species that um, has the perenniality traits. And uh, maybe we take a little bit of that gene pool or maybe we take a lot of it um, and bring it into our annual crop. Still, we have to do a lot of breeding and eventually get those genomes to work together and maybe get a perennial grain. Our, our best success so far on this strategy is perennial rice, which is currently in China, um, yields similar to annual rice and lives for at least six uh, harvests without needing to be replanted. So there's, there's a lot of exciting work going on on, on that side. Um, today I'm just going to talk about this process and the wild perennial I started with is called intermediate wheatgrass. Uh, it was introduced in the United States as a forage grass to feed cattle, but it also had these good properties of making it amenable to, to use as a grain. That's fairly closely in uh, relation to wheat and barley. So that makes it easier too. And, and we have um, uh, some comfort in, in eating a plant that is very close to plants that we're already eating. Um, as it's grown in for, for cattle, um, it might be grown like this where you'd, you'd see the, the hay being harvested. And one of the entry points for, for intermediate wheatgrass as a grain is that we already grow it as a hay and so it's not that big of a transition to start growing it and before we take the, the hay off we first take the seed um, out of the field. That's what we did here. Uh, but first it was combine harvested, um, then the residue was, was cut and then baled up and fed to livestock. Um, it's easy to harvest with conventional equipment. Um, if everything goes well, <laughs> in this case is one of the first fields where we tried that uh, in Kansas and we used a conventional grain harvesting equipment and, and we're able to bring that 
that harvest into a, a mill and process it. And that sort of uh, opened our eyes to the, the potential. And that was about 2007 when we first did that. And over the past you know, 13 years, we've been trying to just to expand upon that idea and, and increase the, the knowledge about how to grow it and uh, primarily increase the yield potential of the varieties that farmers can plant. We replaced it into a, you know, as I said, a truck and, and hauled it into a mill in Western Kansas. Uh, this grain has a, currently a hull on it that had to be removed. That uh, took a little bit of extra processing. They were able to do that for us, but this is a step that um, grains like, like wheat don't have to go through. And so when it comes to bringing this grain to market, that can be a barrier for us is, is being able to do that processing. For on the breeding side, I'm, I'm looking at trying to create varieties that won't need that extra processing step. That's still some years away. We were able to turn that, that grain into flour and, and work with a, a local baker that uh, experimented with it and, and said you know, up to 20% mixed with, with wheat made a loaf of bread that he thought was as good as any he'd ever tasted. Um, that gave us a lot of excitement um, to take it into other potential products. Um, that we were approached with from Patagonia Provisions uh, around 2012 to consider developing a product with them with Kernza. At that point, we were really seeing it wasn't ready, and it did take about five years of development time before this long root ale came out uh, produced in Oregon. Uh, the grain has been grown around the country in various places, uh, and the, the beer is sold mostly in the Western United States. But that that a moment when that happened was really a, a leap forward in interest and support from, from many uh, researchers, but also funders and uh, 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 industry collaborators that now saw the potential for, for this grain. Other micro brews have, have also uh, come out uh, over the years. Uh, fairly easy to put in 15% of, of your mash as, as currency grain and, and make a, a good tasting beer. So on the breeding side, which is really my work, um, a lot of what we've done is to grow thousands of plants. In this case, it was about 20,000 plants. You can't maybe see it from the picture here, but each of those plants is a, a few feet apart in the row. And uh, every plant has a name and a number, uh, 20,000 individuals out there that were each measured and, and harvested separately, uh, kept track of their data, and then we picked kind of the best 100 out of those 20,000 uh, to be the parents for the next generation. Um, this is a, a cross-pollinating species. Uh, it means that pollen from one plant has to go to the other uh, neighboring plant to, to make seed to form. Uh, that's, that's handy for us. It's easy to make crosses because of that, because it's, it doesn't naturally uh, self-pollinate. We can easily make crosses in the greenhouse just by taking the, the heads of one plant and putting them in a bag with the heads of another plant and you, you smack that with a stick about once a day and, and the pollen from one plant goes to the other and you get uh, cross seed forming. That's been a, a lot of what we've done over the past uh, several decades. So that process um, has, has been useful to us. We just last year put out an evaluation in the field looking at um, are we making progress and uh, in this graph we have the breeding cycle across the bottom from zero. That means the stuff I started with um, from Rodale Institute and USDA, um, over five generations of, of selection. And if you look at the bottom graph here, that's just grain yield. You can see we went from about uh, 240 uh, kilograms per hectare up to uh, about 540. So more than doubling over these, these five generations, they were taking between two and three years per cycle. Uh, but so good progress, but we still want to, to go faster. Um, I'll talk about that a bit. Um, seed size increased steadily, but, but more slowly on a percentage basis. Um, and free threshing ability, this is the ability for the, the seed to come out without having to go through that extra processing step. Um, we've more than doubled that over that same five generation time period. Uh, so we know we're on the right direction, but in order for that to be useful, it really has to be in the 95% uh, category, so there's a bit of time to go there. Uh, I would note that this five cycles were, were completed really about by 2012 or so. So uh, we have additional cycles beyond these five that just weren't part of that evaluation. 
Um, so here's what some of that change looks like. Um, one of our problems is with wild plants is the seed falling out before we can come by with a harvester. And these, these heads on the right, um, all I did was take those and tap them lightly on a table. And you can see all these, the seed here uh, came out without uh, really natural threshing. So um, as the wind blows and the, the plants hit each other, that seed would just start to fall on the ground. The farmer would not be able to, to collect it uh, as grain. Whereas the plant on the right is highly shatter resistant. I did the same smacking of, of the heads on the table and as you see all the, all the grain remains in the head. You can see these little grains here um, that, that are in there and uh, there are plenty of seed there, but it has to, it's gonna take a little bit more aggressive uh, threshing to, to get the seed out. And that's, that's what we want. We want the seed to come out when we want it to, but we, we don't want to come out before we're ready. That's kind of a, a fine balance that these domestic plants need. Yeah, that's the next, the next thing is, is free threshing seed. Um, some plants are like these on the left where you can see there is a papery hull naturally around the, the seed uh, in a natural environment that helps to protect the seed, it helps the seed disperse. Uh, but in, in a domestic plant, we're gonna provide those, those services. So we're gonna help that plant get its seed where they need to go, which is our fields. Um, and so it doesn't need that, that uh, papery hull anymore. And so now we can, select genes that uh, will allow that seed to, to come off just with a natural threshing process like wheat or um, other domestic grains do. Um, it's exciting to see the increase in seed size, this kind of close-up picture, you can see these developing seeds in the, in the head. And as the seeds are now two to three times bigger than the wild uh, plants that we started with, um, it's beginning to look actually like a, like a grain crop. So we want to um, accelerate this uh, if, if possible and um, not take uh, another 30 or 40 years to get to a domestic crop that yields as much as wheat. And so we're using this technique called uh, genomic selection. If you look at um, this cycle shown here, um, this is all happening in one year. So we might start here at the bottom center. We, we plant um, uh, 100 of our best plants from the previous generation in the greenhouse, um, let those intermate, and then we'll plant back uh, by late summer 5,000 seedlings. We'll take DNA from those, and that's called genotyping. So similar to, to scratching your, your cheek and sending in a sample to 23andMe, um, we're not manipulating anything. We're not changing the plants with this. We're, we're just looking at what genes uh, might be there, um, uh, determining how these plants are related to each other, just like you might determine how you're related to um, your human relatives using a DNA, DNA markers. Um, so uh, from that, we can we can use this little this thing off the the left hand side is process of developing a, a model that predicts uh, what uh, plants are going to behave in, in certain ways. And this would be like getting your data back from 23andMe that says, hey, you might have a, a risk for disease or you might uh, tend to be uh, have a certain color hair um, if you have certain uh, DNA fragments. And that's the same thing we're doing here. And so we, we can take this model that we're developing and say, oh, this plant's only three weeks old now and it's, it, it's a tiny plant in the greenhouse, but if we grow it up, it's probably gonna have really big seed or it's gonna thresh very easily. Um, we can predict that from that model. And instead of waiting three or four years to collect data in the field, we'll, we'll have that data instantly and pick the best plants. Um, that's that apply the genomic selection model step and say pick out our 100 best plants. And within one year, we're back uh, on that same cycle again. So we can potentially, it's looking like from, from the day we've seen double or triple our, our rate of progress by using this approach um, without really increasing the cost at all of, of that. So it's, it's exciting to use, use this uh, molecular uh, technique. Uh, it's, it's helped by the fact that we've actually sequenced the entire genome and assembled that of, of the species. That was a big, ex expensive, difficult project, but with the, the current uh, state of uh, DNA sequencing and that, that reducing in cost, um, these kinds of projects are now possible for, for intermediate wheatgrass and also for many of the other potential uh, perennial crops that we might be developing in the future. 
So this is the way it looks in the, the greenhouse uh, when we're growing those 5,000 seedlings. Everyone needs to be tagged and numbered before we take the DNA so we um, can trace it back and, and find that, that plant. It's handy to have a little barcode on there. Um, then that training population in the field, uh, this was one year is up to the older plants here and then the, the new ones for the next generation are put out here. Uh, each of those plants that we collect data and that helps us to, to associate the DNA with um, behaviors of those plants or the characteristics of those plants when they get older. Um, I just want to just mention the other kind of work that's been, been going on at, at other institutions such as uh, this uh, published work from Minnesota. Um, this is looking at nitrogen fertilizer rates at different locations. Um, and there were, these curves are showing that yeah, it's about 70 kilograms per hectare of nitrogen we're giving the best seed yields. Um, you can see that seed yields though decline over years. So the first year we had yields 750 to 1,000 kilograms per hectare, but as we go, um, that falls off rather quickly. So um, this is one of the um, primary research directions that uh, management is taking right now is trying to consider how to sustain that yield and also breeding for sustained yield. Uh, perhaps intercropping with, with other species, um, renovating those stands, uh, or just utilizing the forage differently might continue to uh, stimulate uh, grain yield over time. All right, so um, yeah, and even, even seedling establishment is one, one important uh, step in, in the process that we really need to consider. Um, those plants have to just get from the seedling stage or seed stage to seedling stage and that establishment um, requires a whole you know, another array of, of research activities. Um, but you know, we're excited about what, what the future is bringing um, as every new crop, um, every new generation happens. Um, our new uh, generations growing in the field right now, uh, I go out and look at the plants on, a, on an almost daily basis. I'm excited for the next year of collecting data and what that means for the progress we're gonna make and what farmers will hopefully be able to, to be planting in their field soon. All right, so with that, I am finished with my presentation. I'm gonna pass it over to Tessa. Great, thanks Lee. Um, let me share my screen here. Is that working or here? There we go. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Yep. Great. Um, so I'm Tessa Peters and I'm going to talk a little bit about bringing Kernza to, to market. So we talked about um, some of the research behind how this crop has been established and things like that. And then I'm going to talk about how we take this research project and continue the experiment um, to develop the supply chain and the products that you might be able to find on the market. Um, there we go. So, did I go too far? Okay, sorry. Um, so first of all, I wanna just talk a little bit about the name Kernza, which is the trademark name that's owned by the Land Institute. Um, it is a portmanteau of the words kernel, which is the seed of a cereal grass, and Kanza, which is the native tall grass prairie in Northeast Kansas, and it's also an alternate name of the Ka people. So this is, um, this is how we came up with the name for, for this grain that's, that, it, that comes from intermediate wheatgrass, but that we sell as um, an, under this trade name anytime we are, we're making a product that contains the grain. So as I said, it's a trademark owned by the Land Institute. The reason that we use this trademark is, is to allow our commercial partners to differentiate their products in the marketplace um, so that they can tell the story of perennial agriculture, which is very different and, and is a whole other step forward from a lot of the regenerative practices that we hear so much about. Um, so perennial goes one step farther. It also allows us to, to control a little bit the, the narrative and the storytelling and make sure that the livelihood for growers is part of that storytelling and that they get to have input and so do all of the stakeholders along, along the way. So we talked about extra processing steps in terms of um, 
these these grains needing to be dehulled. So we work along the stakeholder, um, along with all the stakeholders to, to ensure that they have input about how the supply chain operates and how the products should be used. Um, it is, it allows us to also ensure that the grain that goes onto the market is high quality and that the products that go onto the market are truly unique and that, that folks can tell the story of that. Additionally, it allows us to protect the research investment of all the partners. So this table just shows the number of people who are working, or the number of institutions that are working on, on these different aspects of growing Kernza that are so important to our understanding of how to bring this grain to market. So everything from you know breeding all the way through to the social sciences and economics which are so important to the growers. So this use of the trademark helps us to, to gain um, royalties and annual fees that go back into ensuring that this kind of research continues to be funded and continues to have um, value for the institutions that are doing, doing the research. We, we administer the trademark at four different places along the supply chain. So we have a trademark license for seed growers, for grain growers, um, for handlers. So that includes um, processing, shipping. Uh, we don't have a, a distribution, aggregation, those kinds of activities in the supply chain. And then also for buyers. So those would be folks who are doing milling and then selling, selling, you know, flour direct to consumers. It's also food companies or restaurants and bakers um, who are selling products to consumers as well. Today, we have about 2,250 acres of Kernza, uh, 125 growers. Most of those acreages are pretty small, uh, 15 acres per grower. But we, what we found is that we really would like to learn more about getting Kernza grown on larger acreages. So we are currently targeting folks who have 20 acres or more to, uh, to dedicate to Kernza. The largest contiguous acreage is 100 acres in the United States. And um, there is ongoing research and production in 15 other countries. So, well, 14 other countries, 15 including the US. Uh, it's in the US, it's grown all over as far west as California and as far east as upstate New York. So we're learning a lot about how it grows in different climates. We're still trying to trying to determine what what its geographic limits are. We know that it needs cold temperatures over the winter in order to form grain, but we don't know what the southernmost boundary is. We don't know what the northernmost boundary is. Um, it's also being grown at in, at really high latitudes um, in northern Sweden, and there's a breeding program there for for that kind of environment. Most of the U.S. acreage is organic um, or transitional, and that is largely driven by the market. Most of the folks um, who are producing products and, and getting those on the market are interested in organic grain. So there are some conventional acreages, but right now it's mostly organic and transitional. Um, Kernza is still an experiment all the way from the field to the plate. There are, uh, there are folks who are trying to develop the food science and understand the nutritional pro profile of this grain, um, what affects the protein, how different, how the gluten works. All of these things are still up in the air. We're experimenting with everything from how to plant it to make sure that it, it gets the best management like Lee was talking about all the way through um, how, how to use it in different kinds of bread products and crackers and things like that. So if we think about the timeline of domestication, we're thinking about 10,000 years ago, we see that modern or that major crop domestication began. And 60 years ago was the green revolution. And now 15 years ago, current domestication began. So we have this, this really big gap of 9,985 years to, uh, to bridge. So that is, that is something that I try and 
make everyone keep in mind that the supply chain is new, the harvesting equipment and how to set it for this crop is all something that we're still learning. We know it can be done, but we're still learning how to make it the most efficient possible supply chain that we can. And my slide is not advancing. Okay, here we go. Um, so the goals of commercializing Kernza are to have supply meet demand. Like, like any product, you have this demand, which you see on the right here, which is currently outstripping the supply. We have a lot more folks who are interested in using Kernza, and that's why we're trying to scale up acreage to, to meet that production um, and that demand. We want while we're interested in scaling it up, we want to make sure that it's a transparent process that that all of the growers are are able to talk to one another about these best management practices and that things aren't um, proprietary and and so that we are able to learn the most possible from all of the partners along the way. We want the supply chain to be redundant so that you know if anyone person or anyone institution decides to get out of the game, we're able to continue, um, we're able to continue moving forward without that being a huge disruption. We want it to be diverse. We want large growers, small growers. We want um, geographic diversity, those kinds of things. Um, but we want it to be coordinated and cooperative. We're not in a, in a place right now for there to be a highly competitive marketplace. So far, we're, we're in that pre-competitive um, mode. And of course, all of the folks along the supply chain have to be innovative because this is such a new product and, and um, so many things are have yet to be discovered. So I like to look at this. Lee talked about in 2010 was kind of when he dedicated himself to Kernza. So by 2013 is when we talk about the commercialization sort of starting. He, he mentioned, you know, that it took about five years for Patagonia Provisions to um, develop their, their long root ale. And we call that the wild, wild west. There were small acreages, um, a small number of farms. The folks who were adopting this crop were risk takers. Um, the funding was philan philanthropic and, and it was very much vision led. People were really interested in understanding how we might bring perennial agriculture um, to, to the forefront of the consumer's mind. And now we're in this pilot phase where we are expanding the number of farms. We're also expanding the number of acres that a single farm might might have. Um, we're at the very beginning of this. So, so we're, as I said, we're still in the 100 acres being the largest contiguous acreage um, that that is being grown in the United States. And this is still, you know, led by risk takers who are innovative and um, very much interested in the vision of a perennial agriculture. We're hoping that this phase lasts about 10 years and then we would like to see Kernza in the mainstream that um, we're still having that diverse, transparent and coordinated supply chain, but uh, that, that there are lots of acres and lots of acres on each farm. So right now, um, this the, for folks to get involved, we're really focused on Organic acreage, as I said, the, the market is really driving that. The folks who are the most interested have been organic. There are some, some folks who are interested in conventional grain, and so that's really great that we see that um, part of the supply chain developing. Uh, but there are no herbicides or pesticides approved for use on Kernza. So even if you are a conventional grower, you could, you could use nitrogen fertilizer, but you can't use herbicides or pesticides and then sell it for a human consumable. There are, we're, we are focused on growers who have more than 20 acres to dedicate to Kernza and who have small grains or forage grass seed experience because we've found that growers who have that experience tend um, to be the most successful growing Kernza. You also have to have a really 
big interest in being part of this experiment. Um, we are doing a lot of data sharing and we're working with researchers and other growers and trying to build networks of folks who are sharing this kind of information. So that's a really important part of what is going on with Kernza. Currently, the priorities for Kernza are improved varieties and a stable seed supply. So improved varieties, Lee talked a lot about how we are working toward those improved varieties. This photo, um, you can see that the bottle on the left has a grain that is about half the size of the grain in the bottle on the right. So the varieties are improving in seed size, which is an Im improvement in yield. Um, and we're working to, to build a seed supply so that so that there, there's enough seed available for all of the growers who are interested in, in growing Kernza. Um, right now, there are two approved varieties that can be grown as Kernza. One is um, this fifth cycle of selection that Lee was talking about. You saw in his graphs that um, this is the fifth generation coming out of the Land Institute's breeding program. And then the newest variety and the, fully the only fully finished variety is Minnesota Clearwater which it has been released, um, it was released in the fall of 2019 on a limited release and now has been released at a larger volume um, by the University of Minnesota. We have another priority of, of implementing data collection and data management. So growers who are licensed um, to sell currents of grain will be providing us with all kinds of management data so that we can learn more about um, how the, about the best practices for growing this grain and then share those with, with other growers. We also want to improve access to information and so we've revamped Kernza.org, um, which now how hosts all kinds of different information. This is just a screenshot of the landing page. So um, there are resources for all different kinds of people along the supply chain. So from growers, um, handlers, so these are the folks who do transportation and shipping and milling and cleaning and storage and all of those kinds of activities, all the way through folks who are making products and getting those on, on shelves and consumers who are purchasing those products and making um, use of them. We also have some, some resources for researchers and for anyone who's interested in helping to fund this kind of research. Um, the goal of all of this commercialization work is that Kernza is valued for its ecosystem services. So we talked in depth about um, its ability to preserve water quality and prevent erosion and all of those things. We think that, that um, the the grain should be valued for that. So that some of the price of the grain should reflect that it's doing more than a lot of its annual cousins might be doing in the field um, for the ecosystem at large. We also think that it should be a viable investment for growers so that growers should get a fair price for the, the work that they're doing. Um, and also we have to balance that with the fact that we want it to be available not just as a niche product, not just at a high premium, but for the average consumer um, so that they can afford these kinds of products as well. Uh, I like to end with the idea that we are just beginning this experiment. We have a lot to do and a lot to learn and um, it may not be completed in my lifetime, but certainly we are trying to trying to move in the direction of a perennial agriculture that's robust and sustainable. So thank you very much. And Wonderful, thank you, Lee and Tessa. That was a great breakdown of kind of both of the directions we're, we're really focusing on Kernza right now. Um, we've already gotten some great questions in. Uh, just to reiterate, if you do have questions, please feel free to utilize the chat function, and then I can facilitate those questions to Lee and Tessa. Um, so to start, Lee, someone was wondering what the planting and harvesting cycle of Kernza is throughout the year. Yeah, so the, the planting largely mimics what we'd expect with uh, uh, winter wheat, which means that it has to be planted in the fall and then go through a winter period, which causes the plant to actually make heads. Uh, if you were to plant it in the spring, it would live through the summer and not make any heads that first year. So, um, Usually we recommend to, to farmers that they plant in the fall 
and then the, the next crop or the first crop will be harvested about uh, July or August, uh, even September if you're really far north. So um, that first uh, summer. Um, sometimes uh, the, the establishment phase is a little, little hairy and so there might be too many weeds competing and so you might not harvest that first year. Um, but then there's no planting again after that. And uh, usually if you were to harvest that first year for forage and the following year, you get a good uh, grain harvest next summer. So one harvest or one planting followed by uh, repeated harvest in, in summer to early fall. Great, thank you. Um, Tessa, what is some of the product versatility of Kernza? What, what are it, some of its uh, commercial uses? Yeah, so, um... The, obviously beer and using it as part of the mash and beer is one of the big uses that, that we're seeing a lot of interest in. Um, Kernza has been malted, but most larger scale malting equipment has trouble because it's such a small grain that it falls through the um, grates and meshing that's used in the malting equipment. Um, so, but that is definitely an interest and in that it, that research is kind of ongoing. Um, Beyond that, we there are folks who have products like a sprouted grain cracker from uh, Columbia County bread and granola, all the way to bakers who are making bread and loaves of bread. Um, Birchwood Cafe has a Car Kernza Carmelita bar that's on their menu. Um, those are the big, those are kind of the big uh, things. Oh, and of course, I should should mention that Cascadian Farms has done a done a run of uh, Kernza toasted honey toasted Kernza cereal, and they're building their supply to hopefully launch that um, nationally. Great. And similar to that uh, question, kind of piggybacking off of that, what is the taste profile of Kernza? Yeah, there. So the taste profile it's nutty, <laughs> and um, personally, I think it's really delicious. I, I started cooking with some that I purchased at Prairie Festival and I've been like really amazed with the results. It's very delicious. Um, it's sort of nutty. People can also sometimes say that it has a can have a grassy profile. I don't usually get that. Um, I don't know, Lee, you have the most experience cooking with it and, and working with it. Yeah, it, it can be kind of surprising at times what flavors come out. It's not, uh, it depends upon the recipe and, and also even upon the, the way the grain was grown or, or handled. There can be kind of different flavors that, that pop out of it. Um, it doesn't have quite the same bitterness of, of whole wheat. Um, usually it has, mm -hmm. has other flavors in it. Um, sometimes uh, you can get a, even a honey smell coming out when you, when you bake with it. Um, we, we had a, a test baking with some researchers at the University of Minnesota. They made some cakes and uh, served it at a meeting and people were insisting that it had honey and, um, and cinnamon in it. There was no honey and cinnamon in the recipe, but it tasted like it was made with honey and cinnamon. So um, you can have a kind of spicy cinnamon sometimes and, and often that honey flavor. Um, so, but other time, yeah, it really, really depends on the recipe and the way it's handled. So um, but it, there's, it's a lot of a lot of excitement for for chefs to try something new, and that's why it's you know it's it's fun mm -hmm. because you don't no one quite knows uh, exactly what it's going to taste like when you put it in this new recipe. Making me hungry, um, Lee. Another question: uh, Can you talk about some of the intercropping experiments going on? I know you work a lot with the legumes program, but can you kind of go into what you're looking at in that direction. Yeah. So um, from the kind of agroecological perspective, this plant is a grass and um, it, it, as a grass, uh, even compared to other grasses, it, it likes to use a lot of nitrogen. You can see that picture behind you, that's a dark green colored plant. And, and that, that means it's really good at capturing the sun's uh, rays and using photosynthesis to, to make sugar. But um, that green chlorophyll has a lot of nitrogen in it. So um, that has to come from somewhere. It has to come from um, the organic system, either from uh, manures that may be applied or a rotation from a, a previous crop um, or intercropping, uh, say a legume. So there's uh, plants in the legume family, such as beans or alfalfa, um, have the unique uh, characteristic of being able to have a symbiosis with bacteria that are able to capture nitrogen out of the atmosphere and turn it into nitrate that, that plants can use directly. So it's, 
a, um, really a way to get sustainability into the system because a purchase nitrogen is expensive even if it's uh, even if it's manure these days, it's quite expensive to, to obtain. And uh, um, fertilizers, uh, conventional fertilizers are very expensive. Um, a huge piece of farmers' uh, expenses are pur purchase of nitrogen fertilizer. So um, uh, having a, a natural source of that nitrogen is, is important for, for a better, uh, more sustainable system. So how to do that is, you know, might be ro rotating a, a grass or legume. Uh, from one uh, cycle to the other. Um, as a longer lived perennial, we would hope to be able to add nitrogen as, a, uh, as the plant develops over years. And so it would be great to be able to put legumes in between uh, grass plants and figure out some way to balance that management. Um, so the, the, the primary legume being researched is, is alfalfa. It's the most productive and highest nitrogen fixture really we have available as a forage uh, legume also clovers and, and things like that. So um, playing with different species, different arrangements and different managements are, are a lot of the research going on in numerous institutions uh, around the country. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Tessa, could you go into kind of what the timeline would look like for Kernza being able to be available for hobby farmers or people who'd like to experiment growing with it on kind of a, a smaller acreage? Yeah, I think we're probably a couple of years out from that. Um, we we would have to find first of all develop a relationship with a com with a seed company partner that wanted to serve that market, um, and we would also have to have a seed supply that was that was stable and robust enough to offer that um, to to offer those kinds of markets um, an opportunity. We have a ton of interest from hobby farmers and from gardeners and from folks who won't want to experiment with it. So I'm hoping that, that we'll find the right mix, but we really need to make sure that the first thing that we do is help get the grain and flour um, through the supply chain for products that will be available. And so the focus right now for the, for the nascent seed supply is to get that onto production acres for, for um, that larger production market. Great. Looks like the last question. Uh, Lee, can you go over some of your short-term goals, um, kind of what you're most looking forward to um, in the next couple of years for the, the current domestication program? Yeah, so um, we have yet to uh, release what we consider a variety from the Land Institute. And I have uh, four variety candidates currently in uh, scale up production. This summer, I'm hoping to get maybe 50 to 80 pounds of, of each of these, uh, which will allow us to plant another uh, 20 acres or so of each of those. And so um, that, that's the, the the step of evaluating those, uh, making sure that they're suitable for farmers to grow and what the potential of each of those are. And I hope that within a couple of years, we'll have those available. And I, I think certainly for our region, um, over the last variety we have, we're gonna see a significant increase in, in yield potential and um, ease of growing those. So um, that's pretty exciting to see that coming out. Um, it's also just the, um, continued to results of this genomic selection to, to see how fast we can move traits um, that are important for farmers. Um, but I think uh, it's, it's going to be exciting to see what's, what's possible in the next uh, five years or so. Great. Well, it looks like that does it for all the questions you received. Um, if you have any other questions that pop up after the fact, please feel free to reach out. You all should should have my email from getting the Zoom invite. So please reach out and I can answer it for you or get you in touch with Tessa and Lee. Um, but thank you otherwise for joining us today. If, if you'd like to learn more about Kernza, I know Tessa gave you a little preview of the recently launched website. I would definitely encourage you to check out Kernza.org. It's um, the premier resource for all things Kernza, whether you're you know, looking to learn more about the domestication program or more th things along the supply chain. Um, it's definitely the the number one resource. So I definitely encourage you looking at that. And otherwise, um, please stay in touch on our website. We're, we're intending to do more of these webinars with other lead scientists of ours. So definitely uh, stay in the loop via social media and our website. And uh, other than that, we hope you have a great rest of your day and uh, 
a nice rest of your week. Thank you all. Thanks, Tess and Lee, one more time, and we'll see you all later. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.